Uh, I do not have a lengthy uh, introduction. Uh, I assume everybody here is aware that uh, authors Brent Schlender and Rick Tedzelli have written a new book. It just came out this week, Becoming Steve Jobs. I think it is an extraordinary um, work. Uh, and they'll be out here to uh, answer a few of my questions about it, a few of yours later on. Uh, and we're going to start with a reading uh, from, the, from the book. So without any further ado, Brent Schlender and Rick Tetzelli. Hey John, thanks for being here. Brent and Rick, <laughs> just in case you guys can't tell them apart. No, we try to dress alike. <laughs> Um, do you want to start with the reading? Yeah, I think that might be a good thing to do. Uh, I was trying to think what would be an appropriate thing for our first book reading event. So I'm going to read from the beginning. And uh, just a short passage, but to sort of put us all in the mood and give you a sense of the voice that we tried to create for the book. This is from the prologue. You're new here, aren't you? Those were his first words to me. His last, 25 years later, would be, I'm sorry. I already had turned, he had already turned the tables on me. After all, I was the reporter, the one who was supposed to be asking all the questions. I had been warned about the unique challenges of interviewing Steve Jobs. In fact, the night before, over beers, my new colleagues at the San Francisco Bureau of the Wall Street Journal had told me to bring a flak jacket to this first meeting. One of them said, only half jokingly, that interviewing jobs was often more like combat than questioning. It was April of 1986, and Jobs was already a journal legend. Bureau lore had it that he had dressed down another journal reporter by posing this very straightforward question. Do you understand anything, anything at all about what we're talking about? I'd had plenty of experience with real flak jackets, believe it or not, because during my years of reporting in Central America in the early 1980s. I'd spent much of that time in El Salvador, Nicaragua, where I'd interviewed everyone from truck drivers motoring through war zones to American military advisors in the jungle, to Contra commanders in their hideouts, to presidents in their palaces. On other assignments, I'd met with obstreperous billionaires like T. Boone Pickens and H. Ross Perot and Lee Ka Shing in Hong Kong, with Nobel Prize winners like Jack Kilby, with rock stars and movie idols, renegade polygamists, and even the grandmothers of would-be assassins. I wasn't easily intimidated, yet for the full 20-minute drive from my home in San Mateo, California, to the headquarters of Next Computer in Palo Alto, I brooded and fretted about how best to interview Jobs. Part of my INEs came from the fact that, for the first time in my experience as a journalist, I would be calling on a prominent business leader who was younger than me. I was 32 years old. Jobs was 31 and already a global celebrity, hailed along with Bill Gates for having invented the personal computer industry. Long before internet mania started churning out wonderkins of the week, Jobs was technology's original superstar, the real deal with an astounding and substantial record. The circuit boards he and Steve Wozniak had assembled in a garage in Los Altos had spawned a billion dollar company. The personal computer seemed to have unlimited potential. And as the co-founder of Apple Computer, Steve Jobs had become the face of all those possibilities. But then in September 1985, which is basically six months before I met him, he had resigned under pressure. Shortly after telling the company's board that he was counting some he was asking for according well, he was courting some key Apple employees to join him in a new venture to build computer workstations. 
The fascinated media had thoroughly dissected his departure, with both Fortune and Newsweek putting the ignominious saga on their covers. In the six months since, the details of his new startup had been kept hush-hush, in part because Apple had filed lawsuits trying to prevent Jobs from hiring away its employees. But Apple had finally dropped those suits, and now, according to the publicist from Jobs' PR agency, who called my boss at the journal, Steve was willing to do a handful of interviews with major business publications. He was ready to start the public fan dance that would begin to re reveal in detail what exactly Next was up to. I was thoroughly fascinated and equally wary. I did not want to get taken in by the notoriously charismatic jobs. I'm hooked. Let's go buy it and read the book now. Um, one of my first questions, before we get more to the subject matter, is more of the mechanics behind writing the book. And I can't really, I've certainly seen books that were co-written before. And you guys go over this, you cover it in the book. But it's co-written, you're co-authors, but it is written in the first person from your perspective. How, how did you guys come to that decision? Well, I think that um, I have no ego. Um, <laughs> all right, that's, that's nonsense. Um, I think that um, we, we, when we started this book, we really, neither of us had ever written a book before, and we really didn't know what we were doing. It took us about a year to get, uh, to get our stride. Um, but it became apparent to us that we were going to use Brent as a character in our, in our story. Um, not, um, not so that it would be a, a Brent and Steve story. We wanted it to be about Steve Jobs. Um, but as a way of um, getting at um, this interesting relationship between uh, Jobs as CEO and uh, a, a source he uh, trusted, um, and that it would be all, it would, we would have been going in and out of uh, first person and third person if we hadn't done it this way, and it allowed us to do things like, you know, there are a couple passages in the book where, where Brent visits the house and talks to Steve directly, and it's much easier for those to be in the first person. Yeah, it comes across very authentic, and the way that, and, and it also, for me, you know, somebody who's, whose career covering Apple is totally, you know, starting in like around 2002, so it's totally the modern era of Apple, and the modern era of, of I think, the whole industry. Um, and it just really was so eye-opening to me how different the relationship was between the business press, the people covering Apple, and company. I don't think it was probably unique to Apple, but that it was a much more personal relationship then than anything now. I don't think anybody gets to go visit Tim Cook's house. Right. Well, I haven't been there yet. Uh, but. Uh, no, it, it was different because this is a, you have to remember when I started writing about this, the industry was very, very young. And the people who were the kingpins of it were very, very young. It was, it was an informal place. It hadn't yet had all the trappings of big corporate America. It was just a, a more intimate place. And so it was easier back then to begin to develop sort of a personal kind of relationship with some of these people because you saw them with some frequency, right. especially somebody that worked for like the Wall Street Journal. Right. It, and a word that you, I think, studiously avoid is you never describe your relationship as friends. It's always with an awareness that there's, maybe adversarial is a little too hard, but that there's even in the casual nature of like a Saturday morning where Steve Jobs called you, invited your kids over, and they watched uh, uh, a year ahead pre-production version of Toy Story, right? In Steve Jobs' living room with his three-year-old son, right? 
That was market research. It, it's personal though, but it wasn't a friendship. It was always with the awareness that he knew he was talking to someone who's writing for major business publications, Fortune. Well, he's very skilled at that though. And, I mean, he, he just had a knack for it, number one. And, and he was, just as he was a skilled negotiator, as we saw when he developed the, all the deals with all the music companies for the iTunes store and the deals that were cut to make the iPhone possible, and a lot of different deals. He became a really great negotiator. Well, those same skills made him a great interview interviewer, although, as I explained there, it's oftentimes he was interviewing you rather than you interviewing him. So. So he was just very, very skilled, and he had a really highly attuned EQ in those kinds of situations. He, you know, he was also had very, very sharp elbows, and so you wonder how could that person have an EQ? But he actually could sense the people's feelings. So I, clearly, you had a good relationship, and it was you. You earned some measure of his trust because throughout different eras of his career, or, or however you want to describe it, you know, from. Uh, early days of Next, to the founding of Pixar, to the really unsteady transition when Apple acquired Next and sort of, I always think of it more as a reunification than as a, a, a acquisition. Um, you know, that he would keep coming back to you and, and trusted you. Uh, I'm curious though, because obviously sometimes he was on the record and you were quoting him uh, for stories and other times he was off the record, um, but you've relayed some of those stories now in the book. And I'm curious, it, it, do you think that there's sort of a statute of limitations on something like that? Like, I don't think you've, I don't think anything that you've relayed in the book is burning his trust posthumously, but. That's a good question. Uh, and no, I don't think I violated too many of the things that he asked me not to reveal. There, there, but one reason is that these tapes I had, I, he would always ask me to put the tape recorder in between us. He'd sit there, I'd sit here, and we'd have our little conversation. He knew my tape recorder really well, and he knew how to hit the pause button, and he would do it. And then, and then, then he'd be done. I said, Steve, can I unlock the pause button now? And he said, oh, okay. <laughs> and so he'd let me do it, and we'd go. But yeah, he was... He, this would happen three or four times in interview when he didn't want me to relate something. And because I never broke that trust, he, right. the trust got deeper and, and more, you know, he, he just trusted me more. So. Right, and I think like one example would be during that period where Apple was in 96 or so, Apple's in trouble financially. They're in trouble worse, probably worse than the financial situation was the executive disarray. I would, would you not think so? And I think you guys make, you guys have some great stuff in there from Fred Anderson, who was the CFO who got brought in and, and stayed there. Um, once they hired him, I think even though they were on the verge of bankruptcy, they were still in better shape financially than they were in terms of products, leadership, technology. Oh, definitely that, yeah. You, you want to speak to that? Yeah, I mean, it, the process of, of turning the company, of stabilizing the company had actually begun a little bit uh, under Emilio, um, who, who in our little world is, uh, we remember him for having called Brent a, a literary axe murderer. Um, but... Uh, but it, it had started, and one of the cool things that happened, or, or one, of the, one of the clear signs that, uh, that Jobs had changed from the man who uh, was at Apple um, the first time around, was that he assembled a team that was partly guys he knew, partly some Apple folks, partly some outsiders. He assembled his team very carefully and he really, that was the beginning of establishing this. I mean, when you think about it, it's really remarkable how they went from that disarray to an incredibly stable executive team that 
if you look at it from 1997 till his death, there's sort of one transition era around 2004, 2005, but that's an amazingly stable, stable team. Right. The transition would be when the Avi, uh, Avi Tavanian and uh, John Rubenstein software hardware, respectively, left. And, you know, maybe just I, I, like in Avi's case, I mean, I, it, you know, I think a true retirement. I think, you know, yeah. he worked his ass off for 20 years on that system and took his just rewards. Right. Uh, but yeah, otherwise a lot of, and there's a lot of people who are still there from 97. And oh, he, yeah. and, the, and the guy, you know, the thing is like, if you, if you look back to the Mac team, um, you know, those guys worked incredibly hard. Um, it was really intense. It was this burst of frenetic brilliance. And basically that never happened. That didn't happen again. I mean, very few of those guys were involved in the next iterations of the Mac. Um, it was a crew that really got burned out. And so this time he comes back in, in 97 and he's looking at it for the long term. Like I gotta, I gotta have a group that I rely on. I gotta, I gotta go step by step. And it's a, it's a, it's a totally different managerial style. Um, I, think, I think it was in the part of the book where you talked about having seen Toy Story early and you, you mentioned that the saga of Steve Jobs' career, in broad strokes, sounds like a Pixar movie. There's a protagonist, charismatic, all sorts of good things to say about him, but who brings about his own downfall due to uh, his flaws. Uh, goes into exile, is tortured by the exile, and then has an extraordinary opportunity to redeem his, uh, not himself, but redeem his career. Right? And it all comes down to that 96 period where Apple needed help. And Next was there. And there's even the side story of B and Jean Louis Gasset's company, who could have been, and it would have prevented the whole thing from happening if he had just signed a $120 million offer, which was pretty generous. And then it never would have happened. Right. Um, but part of it, though, was that Emilio had to go. And, and like you said, where Brent is effectively a character in this story, part of that is that feature story that you wrote. Uh, Something's Rotten in Cupertino. <laughs> which the headline alone, I think, gives you a good sense of the story. Now, that was a cover story for Fortune in early 90s. Early 97. Uh, and so it's after they've purchased Next, which happened, I think, like around Christmas 96. And at the time, Steve Jobs' thing was, I would like my top guys from Next to be assured of leadership positions at Apple. I want to take care of them. But he had no real formal involvement with Apple other than as an advisor to, to Gil Emilio. Um. Well, it's an interesting part of the book because um, at that point, um, Steve started talking to you on the side um, and about what was going on, what he was finding now that he had returned to Apple. But he was ambivalent even then. He wasn't really sure. I mean, he was, he was thrilled to death at the success that had suddenly occurred at Pixar. It made him a billionaire. That was a company that, that seemed golden and charmed. And, and he loved that company too. He, he wasn't as intimately involved in its day-to-day -day operations, but it, it made him rich again. It made him, made him, it won him credibility again as a businessman. And, and he didn't want to, screw that up either. And then to go, what, to this sick company in Cupertino that, that you know, really ought to be bulldozing its excess inventory into a landfill? And, you know, do I really want to run that place? And it was hard for him. It took him almost nine months to just make up his mind. Well, my question is about the, the cover story, I guess, is, and, you know, Gil Emilio clearly, as you said, sees you as, you know, what the axe, axe literary axe murder literary axe murder 
Because effectively, that, that story did him in. It, it, I think that prior to that, because I remember it. Uh, I, I, you know, it's funny. It's like I wouldn't have remembered your byline, but I remember the story. And it, it was devastating in terms of, of characterizing the, the leadership void at the top of Apple. You know, they desperately needed a new operating system, and they, they didn't have it, and they had well, nobody who could do give, it. You actually have to give Emilio credit for two things. He hired Fred Anderson, <laughs> and the company was at the same time hiring, con uh, has a contingency plan for filing for bankruptcy and protection from his lenders. And, and Fred didn't know that until he arrived. So, so Gil Emilio did that. He also, and because Fred, Fred Emilio came in, and cleaned up, and it got renegotiated some of the for some of the terms of the debt. He was able to give Apple some working capital, and it was that working capital that allowed Emilio to buy Next. And Emilio did the right thing by buying Next. So it's unfair to paint him as a incompetent CEO. He actually did two really great things. Otherwise, Apple would have died. But are you trying to get at like the the question of objectivity and how do you decide? Well, objectivity is probably the wrong word. But do you feel though that you were helping position things so that Steve would be able to take a bigger role? No, because he it was more complex than that. I mean, the board of directors was unsure too. There there was a lot of uncertainty about well if not Gil Emilio, who? And Stephen made it very clear he didn't think he was interested in the job. Right. This was in February when I wrote that story, and he didn't, he didn't actually agree until September. So, and he, he didn't even take an operational role until July or August. So this was way before that, and it wasn't him trying to sabotage the company. It was already sabotaged. Right, and one thing, and so, Forever since, there's been speculation as to whether he plotted all along to return as CEO or not. Your, your book makes clear that he, his uncertainty was genuine and deep. And you guys describe it as like probably the biggest change in his personality from his early days. Yeah, it was, it was, it was the way he, what we realized, you know, we, we, we did not totally get this when we started out. I mean, one of, the, one of the things that happened with the book is that I sort of went into it assuming that Brent knew everything. And, you know, that I was, gonna, I was just gonna work with Brent and we were gonna get this down on paper and it was just gonna all funnel out, you know? And the thing is that we learned a lot in the reporting process and, and and we realized things that were sort of gaps in in what you actually understood because you know covering a company on a on a daily or weekly basis is very different from looking back at them over over the long haul so in the case of 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 um, this period when Steve was trying to decide, I remember um, you know one of in, it was in an early interview we had with Avi Tavanian, and then we had one with John Rubenstein, and we were talking to them about this, and they were they were totally clear that this was not this was not Steve's plan. I remember Avi said to us, you know, it wasn't like we were all excited about being bought by Apple. Apple was the sick company, in our opinion, you know. Next actually had a product that was selling and that we were earning more money. The trajectory was up. Apple, the only question about Apple in 1996 was who's going to buy it or is it going to disappear altogether? And when you start talking to those guys and you start talking to some other people around that time, it it really became clear that he, he didn't know what to do. And the fact that he didn't j immediately jump in, the fact that he sort of thought about it, it took six months before he got involved with the company at all, and then there were three months before he decided he was gonna come back in an ICO position. 
it's the beginning of, of him starting to make decisions over a long period of time. And you can see an evolution. You can see that he sells the company to Next, and then it does not take him long to realize he, he cannot stand Emilio and he doesn't respect what he's doing with the company. And then he does make a decision to torpedo Emilio. I mean, that was, yeah, that but, was a plan. Right. But as to whether he was going to come back, right. he had a lot to figure out. And, that, and, and, and then he started applying that when he, came, when he did become ICEO. You know, he, he moved really slowly. The first thing was think different. Um, and then, you know, then the iMac, which was essentially sort of, a, a, in some ways, a, a design uh, trick to, to get everybody excited about the company again. And that was the beginning of this step-by-step -step process. It's funny, too, though, that he was so reluctant to take over it, because the one thing that clearly is recurring through his career from the very beginning with the Apple One and the Apple Two was he liked to make boxes. He liked to control everything about it, the color, the shape, the corners. Um, it was what he did at Apple. It guided the Macintosh, which you know was clearly yeah. the biggest hit that he had the first in at Apple. Um, it did him in at Next with his obsession with making this magnesium cube, you know, with these insane uh, corner, yeah. you know, sharp corners that you couldn't really couldn't make even a mold for. And they had to make their own factory for them. And, and even at Pixar, which is crazy that his original idea for Pixar was for them to be a computer hardware company where you'd buy a computer from Pixar to do your own graphics. And the movie thing was like, you know, the guys in the, you know, the, the back room. Right. Well, he, is a, he was a product guy. That's what he always called himself. I'm a product guy. The only reason he started companies is because that's the only way you could build a product. You had to have the wherewithal and the resources to, to be able to get it out of the sandbox and actually make it. And he loved to see it in the store. He loved to, to get something and make it tangible. So... Of the two, and in, in the exile years, after he got forced out of Apple and before he came back as ICEO, which of the two companies do you think was more important to his improved leadership, Pixar or Next? That's a good one for you to answer. I think, well, I would say Pixar um, because... I mean, they're both critical. He learned in different ways from both experiences. I think Pixar, and this may be my, my own bias, but I think, he, um, I think he really learned stuff from Ed Catmull and then from Lassiter that fundamentally shaped the way he managed after he returned. Right. He learned. He learned patience from from uh, Catmull. He learned how to how to how you can have a team that stays close to you. And from Lassiter, he learned. And and the animators there, he saw how creative people could work together and how you could keep a group of creative people together in a long lasting way. That was the amazing thing about the Pixar experience is that. You know, those guys were together for like 20 years before they got to make, um, before they got to make Toy Story, and they were all doing other things. They were, and they all wanted to make a movie during that whole time. But, but this guy kept them together, and so he he started to understand that. And if you look at um, even now, like Tim Cook still talks about the importance of small teams. We want small teams working on all the different things, working together. And that's directly a result of the Pixar, the Pixar experience. Um, let's skip forward a little bit to, to modern times. When did you guys decide to write the book? Well, we talked about it. For many years, I, in fact, there was a time, I talked to Steve about writing a book about the career. He, in fact, he came to me once and said, why don't you work with Johnny Ive and me and we'll do a book on the art of Apple. And this was about the time that the iPod 
came out, and he was very proud of that, but it hadn't turned into the rocket ship it was going to turn into. And then suddenly he just got way too busy. Johnny got way too busy. There was no way they could do a book project. So, so I kept trying to think, well, what could we do? What could we do? And I kept asking him and suggesting. But eventually it just, uh, it just kind of died. The idea died. And, uh, but, but I knew I had all this stuff and this understanding. And I, I didn't want to get in the way of, of other things he wanted to do. When he decided he wanted to work with Walter Isaacson, I was disappointed. But, you know, it's his life. And... Uh, <laughs> So it, I was disappointed, but I would, and, I, and we didn't do this because I was disappointed in that book. We did this because I thought there was more to say about Steve. We had. And a more intimate way to think about him as a person. We had, um, we had been talking for, for a while about things that, that Brent could do with Fast Company, which is where I'm an editor now. And, um, um, then um, he, uh, Brent's Quaker, uh, or Quaker in a certain way. And um, so one day he casually mentioned to me that he had all these tapes that he'd never transcribed. So I was like, huh, maybe there's something there. And we, we decided to write a story about that for Fast Company. Um, and then about halfway through it, we realized that it, we could work together um, and, and try to create what became Becoming Steve Jobs. Um, and I was excited about it because, you know, a lot of, as a journalist, I think, you know, everybody wants to write a book at some point. And I'd thought of other things, but now that I've worked on this one for three years, I can't imagine what you do if you work on a book that you're not totally fascinated by. I'm still really intrigued by Steve Jobs, and I don't think we've come close to, you know, finishing the exploration of Steve Jobs. There are going to be so many other books after this. So. I think one of the things that makes the book so unique is this mix of extemporaneous reporting that you've done from the 80s through the present and, and that you had and you could go back to combined with, to me, the extraordinary cooperation you guys got from people who he knew and worked with and who were close to giving their hindsight. Because like you said, when you're doing the reporting on the new iMac in 1998. Well, it's all right there and then. It's about the color of the plastic and whatever. 15, 20 years later, it's a different perspective that everybody has on that. So when did you guys first start approaching the sources, you know, people like Tim Cook, uh, people like uh, Steve's widow, Laureen Paul, Powell Jobs? Well, it's a combination of that. I mean, it comes, what happened for us came directly out of Brent's long relationships uh, over, developed over the course of the year. The first thing that happened was um, that uh, we went to Apple after our Fast Company was, story was published and um, asked if they would, we said we've, we've sold a book, and we asked if they'd cooperate. And they said, absolutely not. We have no interest. Um, you know, we wish you hadn't written the Fast Company story. Um, See, that's the apple I know. <laughs> yeah, right. So we wish you hadn't written the Fast Company story. You didn't give us a, you didn't give us a heads up, um, et cetera. And they were like, no way. This is not happening. And so then, you know, you do what you do. You start going around the company and you start interviewing other people who are outside. Now, a lot of those people were people Brent had talked to who had come to an unhappy end with their relationship with Steve at Apple at some point. They had been fired. And for me, as an outsider, it was astounding how to, to sit in on those interviews. These were people I'd never met before. And so this is, this is uh, 2012, it's a year after Steve's, Steve's died, and they're talking about this guy in the, they're all talking about this guy in the first person. The first three people we interviewed cried during the interviews, 
and they'd all been fired and they'd all had these terrible experiences and yet they all talked about how they'd done the best work of their lives for him. So for me it was like, oh, this is going to be really interesting. Um, and so we worked that whole side and we in fact had two thirds of the book written before Apple came back and said, you know, they would give us uh, some interviews. And they gave us interviews with the four, current, four employees who attended his private burial service, um, who were uh, Katie Cotton, was the head of PR, and we interviewed her on the record, Tim Cook, Johnny Ive, and Eddie Q. Not much from Katie made the book, though. I think there's like one sentence. Yes, and I think that um, it was a, um, that was a, it was a curious, um, it was a guarded interview, uh, so, but we really, I mean, she, I think, I think it was, it was also very, it was hard, it was hard for her to do, you know, to be on the record, I think. Yeah, I think that it, my analogy would be that she had spent her entire career playing defense and now she's asked to play offense and she doesn't really even know, you know, how to shoot the ball. Right. So, yeah. Um, anything else before we start taking questions from the crowd? No. Okay. Awesome. Uh, hi, J.D. Leonard calling. Um, and, yeah, I'm calling in. And uh, Todd Perkins wants to know, uh, would Steve... Would Steve be proud of the work that you've done? Well, you know, he, <laughs> he would probably react to it like he reacted to just about everything I wrote, which was, some of it's good, some of it's bad, <laughs> and you know, some of it hurt my feelings. And, uh, but he would never really completely make past total judgment on something that I wrote. Yeah, he'd just say, this is good and this is bad. He didn't want to give me too much credit. So I don't think, you know, I, who knows? We're on the eve of the launch of, uh, of Apple Watch. And for Apple, Watch, for Apple Watchers, we've seen a string of products that everyone doesn't think is going to be a big product before it goes out and then it becomes huge. Every single thing. And what, I, what I've s learned in watching Apple today, the company as a product, which is actually a product of Steve. The, product, the company that we see today is actually something that is his product. So when he passed away, everyone was convinced that the company could not go on without him. And I find myself, as an Apple watcher, just completely mesmerized by what Apple is today and how good they are at what they do. And and I just wonder if you would just reflect on that, because you know the inner sanctum of folks who make up the management team that we know. There's, it was really interesting in the latter part of the last few years of Steve's life, because he was trying to systematize and teach a lot more how he thought, how decisions were made, why certain decisions went badly, because he knew that they had to be able to perpetuate this throughout whoever gets hired into the company as it gets bigger and bigger. And in reality, since he died, there, that company, the company employs 30,000 more people than it did when he died. And so these people, it's an oral history in a way that they're trying to figure out how to systematize because he's not there anymore. And, but it needs to adapt to be applied to today because technology does not stand still. And I think we'll see. I, I actually kind of encouraged so far by what I've seen that, that, that they're not going to miss a beat for a while. I mean, it just depends on the, on the whole world around it, too, though. And if they miss something, uh, that's, that's the way it works in technology. You don't want to miss it. And Apple's missed things in the past. So I, I just think that there's a deep, deep bench of you know, people at Apple right now and they have tremendous resources, and they build something that I would call, instead of mere products, is, is an experience, an end-to-end -end experience that's coherent, that people love, that helps them in their lives. And as long as they can keep that experience consistent and smooth and pleasurable, they're going to be doing pretty well. 
There's a, there's a quote in a book you guys got from Bill Gates. It's going to require the podcast of this to be marked explicit. I, uh, I know how to do that in the XML, so if, if the Apple people need help. <laughs> uh, but Bill Gates told you guys, so many of the people who want to be like Steve have the asshole side down. What they're missing is the genius part. And I bring that up in the context of your question because clearly they did not try to plug somebody in with that half genius, half a-hole personality. I mean, that's, yeah. that's not Tim Cook at all. It's not even close. Nobody ever. I mean, in fact, you, you couldn't almost find a, he's a leader, but he's very different. Do you think it's a problem that the company was set up with him at the hub and not that Tim Cook can't be a good CEO, but that it's a different personality. No, I mean, I think, I, I, I think, you know, that quote is interesting because that quote is more a comment on the people who try to imitate Steve than it is about Steve. Mm. Like Gates himself is very, understands the, the full complexity of what Steve accomplished and, and who he was. Um, I think that the, the, I think one of the things for, that I sort of came to during the process was I had edited a lot of Brent's stories when he was at Fortune and I remember the stuff where Steve spouted off about, you know, a company should be this or a company should be that or he would, he would pronounce, you know, what American trade policy should be or this and that. And I, as an editor, I kept thinking, this is bullshit. He actually doesn't know anything about this. And, and what I realized is that when towards the, by the end of his life, he did understand what a company was all about and how you made it a living thing that could last. And I feel like that's actually going on at Apple. And I think, it's, I think it will be interesting. I think Apple will, will, will stop talking about Steve after this burst that they, where they've spoken around this book. I think they don't talk about it a lot. They, they, they're moving ahead. They're more interested in what Angela Arantz is thinking about than what Steve thought about. Thank you. Um, just broadening the subject a little bit, is there someone alive today, I, I, you know, probably in the business world, who you would say is in the same orbit as Steve? Not necessarily, you know, that close, but at least if he's not there yet, or she has the potential. Oh, I, I would point to, in my limited opinion, uh, I, I'm impressed with. Well, first and foremost with Elon Musk and his SpaceX venture, his Tesla car venture, and his track record and his ability to build enthusiasm and, and he paint these sort of beautiful pictures of how the future should be if you just built what he thought you should build. It's very much like Steve, but it, it, the ambition of it is, is a different kind of scale. And it's not quite as personal as what Steve was trying to address, which is your own, you know, to augment your own intellectual abilities. That's really what Steve was into. And so Musk's not that way. Mark Zuckerberg is a little bit that way too. And, and this, this crazy idea they have of putting up like sort of gossamer wing uh, solar powered drones to to deliver basically broadband services to every corner of the world it's a, it's a very ambitious thing i don't know if it's really just to sell ads it, i i sense there must be something else there that that maybe he has a dream for but i don't know the google guys are always taking shot pot shots this way and that way and you know, it's it's fun to watch. Hi, are there any pieces of advice that you've drawn from researching and understanding Steve's transformation? One of the funniest things that that I've drawn from all this experience of learning even more about him and going back over these tapes and seeing the different behavior patterns at different times of his life is that there's a lot of consistency all the way through too. Yeah, he grew and he changed, but 
but there's certain themes that that have come to make more sense to me. And one is really articulated well by Johnny Ive when he talks about the reason Steve is always so blunt was that he thought it was a disservice to sugarcoat things for somebody. In fact, it was selfish to sugarcoat things when you're telling somebody that their job is not, they're not doing their job well. If you sugarcoat it, you're trying to make them like you. And, and that's not the point. The point is to get the job done. And that that's the way Steve thought. He just could not be sentimental very much when it came to dealing with the products. And it, uh, yeah, he could go way overboard. <laughs> he could be mean, spirited, but there is a consistency to this. It wasn't that he was trying to tear somebody down. It was that he was trying to get better work out of them. And if they couldn't do it, they should leave. <laughs> so he could find somebody who could. Not because he didn't like them, but he didn't like their work. And so, um, you know, I, it makes more sense to me now, and it makes me, it's made me more blunt, to tell you the truth, <laughs> myself. Yeah, that, uh, it's true. Um, I'll add, one, I would add one thing to that, which is that, you know, as, a, as an editor uh, of a business magazine, um, you know, I know that people are always looking for shortcuts to success. And I don't believe there are any after working on this book, which may mean I should get into a new profession. But it, what, what I would do if I were a businessman trying to, you know, improve myself and, and do things better is I would try to, the way Steve learned was really impressive. He took things from all over the place, from all over the place, and all these things went in. They went in there, and something came out out of all of them. No one single piece of advice sort of, you know, stuck out. There wasn't the great shortcut. It wasn't like we're always going to manufacture things this way, or I'm always going to manage things this way. And it's, it's just he had an enormous trust that the accumulation of things that he had learned were coming out into the right thing. Now that le it led him to many mistakes and it, it led him to, to, to many wrong opinions. But, you know, he f when he failed, he, he, he turned around quickly and he always reserved for himself the right to change his mind at the very last instant. And so to me, thinking about things, that's what I take out of this, is there's no shortcut. It's just everything that you put in, everything that you learned, and how do you, you know, how do you process that? How do you synthesize all of that into something new that makes sense for you? That's basically what technology is, anyway. It's a recombinant thing. Most new products, most new ideas are, are taking a new technology and adding it to something else that's already there that makes it more powerful or more able to do something wholly new. It's a recombinant thing, and so you have to keep your eyes open if you're in that business. And Steve had amazing peripheral vision to, to notice what's going on here, there, and everywhere. So. It's, that's, in that sense, you know, that's the nature of technology, and he embodied that just in the way he looked at the world. Great answers. Uh, great questions. I probably should have taken questions from you guys before I got started. Those were really good. Um, but I think it's time to wrap things up. Um, so my thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, my thanks to you two for inviting me to moderate this. Uh, please go buy their book if you haven't done it already. I cannot recommend it highly enough. It is so good. Um, it is available in better bookstores everywhere. Hint, hint, iBooks. Um, uh, uh, and I guess that's it. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much.